author, art and cultural historian, and we are here to discuss her beautiful book, In the Shadow of the Devi Kumon, of a land, a people, a craft. Mom, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. And if we may begin with the first question. Um, in the preface to your book, you've written, the book started as a personal journey, a search for a narrative of the Kumaon Hills, where you grew up. Would you tell us a bit about how you wrote it and how the collaboration with the photographers Anup Sa and Webhav Kaul came about? Well, isn't everything a narrative? We who tell stories, whether it's in history or sociology, we actually are reconstructing thoughts that went before us. And we are now pulling them through a prism, so to speak. Yes, uh, it did begin as a narrative, looking for a journey. Uh, my fate, it seems, was inextricably linked to the Kumau Hills because my husband inherited his mother's house, which was a colonial bungalow in the Rani Khed cantonment. And we had to go and fix it because it was 150 years old. So much like the book Under the Tuscan Sun, we were making trips to the hills, you know, with tiles and with all kinds of building materials. But that wasn't enough really to be there. So when I would sit in a languorous afternoon in the veranda, I would look for things around me that I could explore. And a curiosity was born as to what were these hills really about? Of course, I grew up in the hills because I went to an exclusive boarding school there run by Roman Catholic missionaries and foreign nuns. So though we were in the hills, we really knew nothing about the hills. We only knew what our school and colonial Nenital was about. So there was this curiosity. Who were these people? How did this happen? What was the idiom of what are now the Kumau Hills? And I began a series of projects, articles, reviews into the myth, into the Uttarakhand movement for independent statehood and many others, because at that time I was also a development journalist. And that is where I had my encounter with Anup Shah, who became a dear friend, who was a very talented photographer and naturalist. So when I was writing my book, we I went back to those experiences that we had mounting exhibitions, doing other things, and I requested him, and he was very generous in lending me his beautiful photographs. So he is the prime photographer. I also have a young environmentalist, Webb Hapal, who has contributed, and a very, very fine photographer, Ambassador Dave Mukherjee. So these are really the main people who collaborated with me it was really a journey of 10 years of exploration and friendship before the book happened. Wonderful. So it all Wonderful. came together so into creating this beautiful book. And yes, it, so it was meant to be. And, it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. It's destined to happen, I guess. <laughs> and we're so honored that you gave it to us to publish it. So thank you so much for that. Um, the concept of the Devi. Yes of feminine force is a powerful idea that runs through the book. Could you tell us a bit more about how the idea of the Devi is experienced in the Kumaon region? Well, again, I think there is something intuitive in this and also maybe linked a bit to one's fate. Because, you know, I am a Kashmiri Sarabad Brahmin who by definition are Shaivites. But I've never grown up in the Hindu tradition in, uh, in the sense that, well, like all of us, we know about it, we accept it, but we don't delve into it. Right. However, in traveling in the Kumau, at each and every bend, you cannot help but encounter the majestic Nanda Devi range. And the Nanda Devi range is, of course, the mountain personification. The Devi, as we have learned about in all the Devi Mahatya and in other stories from the Navratras, celebration of the Navratras and others, everywhere I went in the Kumau, there was this celebration of the Devi. 
and there was an inbuilt absolute um, i would say faith that whatever was offered to the devi she would be protecting us and looking after the, all her creatures in the kumau region it was very interesting because village women had this absolutely unshakable faith that these temples to the devi you know even in the kumau all the mountain peaks are dedicated to devis like in almora you have kasar devi and pachar devi and they call all the mountain peaks after devis names so the mother god is cult the understanding of the mother goddess as the protector as the nurturer as the person who really is looking after all her creatures is absolutely prevalent in the whole of kumau and then if one can look at it even a smaller sense you know micro sense because when you look at the women of kumau they are the embodiment of shakti and shakti as you know is the powerful name of the devi they are little durgas the way they hold families communities and their animal and fuel and fodder it is without their strength life in the hills would be impossible so from the little shaktis which are the kumauni women and as you know perhaps that uttarakhand is the unique state which was founded on the struggle of women yes so through that you could see that the nanda devi has sort of come into their homes right and there's also this beautiful yatra called the raj rath yatra which takes place every 12 years started by the chand kings i think it's about 300 year old okay. they it goes from the village of naughty up to rupkund as hundreds of miles where almost 1 lakh pilgrims trek to the uh, base of the uh, of nanda because it's a celebration of how she goes back from her maiti that is her mother's home in naughty village to her husband's home shiva's home in gash and so her statue is carried on a palanquin and the traditional farewell that you give a daughter is given to her by as i said hundreds and thousands of pilgrims villagers who trek those miles to see off to see their daughter off into the mountains into her snow bound home to shiva so all this wraps around the whole of kumau and therefore my book is titled in the shadow of the day meaning this is a land where at every turn the car or of your feet you encounter the snow bound nanda devi rain she being the vacation of goddess shakti in our hindu mythology wonderful so thank you for sharing that in the whole contextual background with us it's a sense of the feminine force has yes. inspired you to write the book in a way um, your book also beautifully yes. describes the flora and fauna of the kumau region and you also mention proverbs and philosophical sayings that allude to the flora and fauna So could you give us some examples of these and their significance? Well, uh, the flora and fauna of the Kumau region is rich. In fact, unlike the Garhwal hills, which are sometimes rather barren, Kumau is lush from, you know, subtropical, which is right down, you know, called the Tarai and the uh, which is almost say a thousand uh, feet above uh, a sea level up to, you know, 6000 7000 feet above sea level then higher as you into the tundra region there is an abundance of forage the variety of trees that are available you know from mm-hmm. the hardwood tun to maple to birch which is called the birch patra then you have the various form the sitar the most popular being the devda tree you have any amount of pine the bhoj patra and is very popular even as traditional offering the bhoj is supposed to be sacred in addition to that you have the banj which is local stunted oak so the variety of tree and foliage undergrowth mm-hmm. is extraordinary well with that you also have the flora where the english flowers including the indigenous flowers like the brahma kamal which is offered at the kedarnath temple which is the unique flower that you find in the heart 
mountains near the snow belt and you have the famous blue poppy so you have a cultivation galore on a you have indigenous uh, animals and bird species varieties of pheasants like chakor and munar then you have different kinds of lizards and you have also the deer all kinds of deer then the baboon you know langur jisko hum kehte hain and all these in really enrich the kumaon hills as yes, naturally villager with this rich uh, substance of nature are bound to draw prisms from nature mm -hmm. so as they say in one of the sayings which are quite humorous also and very colorful and pithy and witty a pechwa's flight is still the roof it epitomizes the short wing of that bird and when you say it even with reference to a man it also means that oh oh you're not going to be a long distance runner you know <laughs> or they also talk about a crow you know a crow's um uh, birth which means it's just a known sometimes they about a ch a person being afraid of a tree trunk because if you're bitten by a bear you'll be afraid of in a tree trunk trunk in the back which is the nature of fear so there are different humorous aphorisms and there are also which are impactful when they talk about a man's innate cunning or his innate fear or other aspects of human nature most of them have taken from a very interesting book by mr gerola which i discovered and there are these nuggets which are found in these books which i have excerpted and put forward for the delight of my readers but one interesting one which i found really uh, you know amusing is when they talk about the way a person's greed I don't remember that one but how a greedy person his stomach is never full but they use okay. the metaphor of an animal to show that so these are the way they and say things wittily without hurting their neighbors or their friends lovely and by being derived from nature they ensure that language also stays close to nature in a way um you've spoken about how you were restoring your family home and in your book the craft of wood carving plays an important role in the traditional life of kumau and you've narrated conversations with many master craftsmen and wood carvers so could you share a bit with us about why this craft is so important in this region um it's very interesting but i believe the culture somehow defines itself some element or some material and it is but natural that the kumaon culture became so closely identified with wood carving because we understand this is a place which is dense with trees and wood interestingly the wood that is actually used is now extinct it's a kind of a mahogany a himalayan mahogany called the tun tree and it is rare it's a beautiful hardwood reddish in color and it lent itself beautifully to carving because that kind of texture required the soft woods like pine do not lend themselves to fine carving mm -hmm. wood came a kind of statement of prosperity it also became a way of celebration of life because when the chokats and windows were carved with deities with the flora of mona it embellished the person's home it was also like an offering to the gods that bless my home see that you don't enter let you know evil spirits enter or harmful spirits enter my home and this is on the chokat of the village homes but interestingly this a whole craft not indigenous many professors and scholars in the kumaon region mentioned to me that there were these so called um, you know uh, uh, groups of craftsmen originally came from perhaps as far away as gujarat or from the nevari tradition of nepal 
bringing with them a pan indian iconography okay. which you know they carried for example you don't see elephants in the kumaon but they have carved elephants in the chokhats so they were bringing this idiom into the kumaon and from as far as 1500 meters to 7000 8000 9000 meters we see these beautifully embellished doorways and windows which become emblematic of the region and to me it is the prime craft of the region the way they express themselves in a, in 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 understanding that they were also part of a pan hindu and a pan indian tradition and the beautiful images of old garden in nagpur yes and most of them yes and most of them are from anup shah's uh, you know collection and some of them of course i took with the photographers and things and i'm truly grateful to him for the wonderful pictures that he's taken of a tradition that you know somewhere like in the road to milam glacier they've disappeared mm-hmm. people have just pulled them out and burned them and sometimes collectors from abroad like the germans in the 1950s just took them away uh, out of our country hmm okay um in uh, your book you have mentioned the role of the lakshmi ashram where young women trained to become teachers can you tell us a bit more about the traditional role and the changing role of women in the you know in my book i tried very hard to actually give a very holistic understanding of the region and not isolated from the people the tradition the history of that region mm-hmm. lakshmi ashram to me was emblematic of this changing role of women mm-hmm. a sarla devi was an english woman uh, mm-hmm. who came to india mm-hmm. uh, she was the daughter of an admiral and came in 1932 to help gandhi ji because she was very impressed by the freedom struggle and she took part in the civil disobedience movement yes. and then she took on the name of sarla devi and in 1946 she actually carried out what gandhi ji was urging gandhi ji had come to pawsani and stayed there and launched one of his civil disobedience movements because as you know the freedom struggle was not just a political movement it was a movement for the emancipation of the indian soul yes yeah. and so gandhi ji then indicated to her that if she really wanted to help she must bring the women out yeah. she took this very seriously and in 19 i think 46 or something established the first school in a sort of a, a tradition of modern secular education in kosani on 11 acres of land and she called it lakshmi ashram considering that all little girls were little lakshmis <laughs> and they came into the fold and she started teaching them adding to them even things like technology in fact in the uh, 1960s or something the himalayan technology group was founded by actually acolytes and people who were alumni of lakshmi ashram and they brought forward that a educated woman was really the woman of progress in the hills because she would bring through education a change in the development strategies of the whole uh, region right down to the village level you change you educate a girl you educate a family you educate a family you educate the community so this was the experiment that gandhi ji had been urging on all of india and she was a one of the she was the woman who actually started this Uh, a well known activist gandhian activist radha bhat who was later on the head of lakshmi ashram is the one who actually encouraged a lot of hill women to go out and take these ideas against prohibition against environmental damage into the field and the uttar uttarakhand movement is actually rests on the backs of these women educated at lakshmi ashram so it's a very important institution in the history of kuma and its modernization um you've also written about the role of jagars uh, religious songs dedicated to various deities 
So could you shed some more light on this practice and its importance in the life of the people of Kumar? Well, it's interesting. I go back to the renovation of our house in the, in the Rani Khet Hills, where sometimes at night I would hear these people singing or, you know, having some sort of a, a community dance till in the wee hours of the morning. And that took me into a search as to what are jagars. Jagars are basically ceremonial, ritual, dances, performed to music that can be celebratory. It can be to a single deity or God or to more. Usually in a jagar, there is a baladia, you know, a jagaria that is a trained singer who sings in a fairly monotonous voice these long ballads, you know, of the, uh, you know, there's this love story of Alu Shahi and Rajola. There are tales from the Mahabharata, the Ramayan. There are stories of the magical gods in the Kumau, such as the god Golu, that is. It doesn't matter which is the deity that you are trying to propitiate. But that deity that you're trying to propitiate is who the Jagariya or the singer. He's accompanied by two drummers with two different kinds of drums. You know, they call hurkos or hurkia. And these two with a symbol, you know, to thali bajate, jise kehte hai, but we call them symbols, you know, the clashing of the symbols. And they begin this monotonous singing, which is melodious and catchy, just like a kavali, you know. Okay. And uh, they begin, but it is propitiating God. Because you want something from that God, which is a problem in your life. You may be wanting something that you need for your family or your son or your daughter's not getting married. And so you perform a jagar. And when you perform a jagar, sometimes it goes on for hours. And it is akin to shamanistic rituals. Because from the crowd, usually, somebody rises on who, who is a medium. Jispe kehte devta agya. And when the Devta Agya, the medium rises, they ask him questions that bother them, that they need to know. And this celebration, it in a way is like a psych what we go to therapists these days, or we say psychiatrists, but this is a kind of a village psychologist, you know, in the kind of bringing the village problems to the forefront, seeking an answer. And together, finding a way to, to uh, un Sorry. answer it. These jagariyas are quite famous. And to find them, I had to travel to a couple of villages because we were looking for famous jagariyas to talk yeah. to them. And they told us some of these jagars can go on for 22 days. So for 22 days, you carry on. And these ballads carry on. The story of the a god or the mythology of that god is again repeated in different forms in different narratives and mm -hmm. depending on the problem or depending on the celebration mm -hmm. this becomes a cardinal aspect of village community cultural life okay okay wonderful to have you know brought this out in your book uh, a lesser known yes. aspect of the culture of the region um, yes, but it is also popular in the, in the Nepal. It also okay. is popular in the Nepal. So that whole region is, uh, you know, uh, Jagars is something very popularly performed. Okay. Good to know. Um, you have um, mentioned previously yeah. that the state of Uttarakhand, the movement for the formation of the state, derived its strength from the initial women's movements that it started. And you also described the importance of the tree species of Kumaon and the impact of the Chipko movement on forest conservation in your book. So could you tell us a bit more about this environmental movement and its impact? Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, the Chipko movement was in Garhwal. And it was in 1972 where the women hugged or chipkoed the, the ash trees that were being cut down. Uh, for use by the Simmons uh, factory to make cricket bats. Mm. And because it was part of a community forest, mm. this group of women found mm. this as a form of satyagraha, a form of civil disobedience taught to us by Gandhiji to stop mm. 
the people from coming and chopping down the trees. Naturally, when it was reported in the press, it caught everybody's imagination as a unique and wonderful way to protest against environmental degradation. Worse, in the Kumao, especially around where Osani is, alcoholism had become the bane of the hills. In fact, they started selling alcohol at 50 pesa or one rupee a pouch. And they would sell it to women also because it warmed their bodies. It's cold out there. Of course. But as a result of it, it became something that was very detrimental to the health and families. And men were alcoholics lying on the road, spoiling the whole community and family life. So the twin aspects of deforestation and alcoholism is what roused the women to actually get together, band together, form small consortiums, go out into the villages and educate them why this was bad for them. And that beginning of the environmental movement started like this in the 70s, in the 80s, there were very famous incidents all over Kumau, how women had been the forefront of this. And that is how the old Uttarakhand movement, you know, the, the political movement that started, the Uttarakhand Seva Nidhi and other UKSS and other groups, political groups, start, it was started on the backs of these women. And then that grew and finally led to the political formation of the new state. Absolutely. Yeah. This is what grew and led to the formation of the Uttarakhand political movement. Mm -hmm. And there were many instances in Nainital and Garur and other places in Dania, where mm -hmm. there were evidence of these women's groups resisting and mm -hmm. calling out youth mm -hmm. to, in fact, right now I'm writing a book about just that calling the youth to assist them. So it was youth and led by women who mm -hmm. formed the backbone of this whole movement that until we get state-grown policies, homegrown yeah. policies, mm -hmm. homegrown mm -hmm. leaders, there will never be actually true development because a lot of this wood and logging was going to feed sleepers and industry outside of the hills, going to the UP factories. And they said, all our wood is being taken away all our mining is taken away and it goes to regions outside of the hills. So where is the development of the hills? And they began to question that, you know, what is ours should stay with us. And this is how this became a kind of a dynamic uh, force, which then infiltrated the um, whole political uh, thinking of that state. Um, um, so coming to the formation of the state of Uttarakhand, which now is some years ago, uh, do you feel that the women's groups have achieved what they sought to achieve? Have their lives improved as a result of the formation of a new state? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in forms of, you know, education, women have come out. The girls don't want, I mean, the girls are more educated than the men. They don't wish to marry men who are less educated than themselves. If a girl's at 12, she's not going to marry a boy just because he's, uh, you know, an eligible boy in the village. She's mm -hmm. looking for an educated boy. So yes, from that point of view, there's educational institutions in the hills that have come up. There's an understanding of the plains culture in the better, the better aspects of the plains culture, which is access to language, tools, technology and other things, but no in the sense that there is also copying of the plains culture. For example, tourism has wrecked the state. It is also the money earner, but it has wrecked the state because it has been indiscriminate. The building uh, of the hills indiscriminately has destroyed forestry. There are many other kinds of problems that have arisen schemes that are brought in from the plains do not often adapt to the hills. For example, they try to give power by making big projects, but that doesn't work very well in the hills. It's better to have a hydroelectric power in smaller sort of uh, uh, micro. So there are many developmental issues which have arisen. And then, you know, state industrial policies have not really taken effect because uh, Uttarakhand is not really an industrialized community. If it has to, the kind of industry that has to come in would be more like tech driven. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. where you can be in the mountains and you know uh, create some sort of a, a labor, labor force as well as some kind of a um, in growth of, of money from that kind of industry but industrial plants and other things they i think grow, uh, created some big uh, industrial parks around dehradun and other places which are tax free or excise free but it caters more to the foothills rather than the mountains and high mountains so a lot of thought is being put into it there's a hill development council there are many kinds of uh, deliberations on it and i think we will grow into the right way but the transition process is painful in many aspects agriculture also is not really taking off the way it needs to take off in terms of orchards or growing things through hydroponics and you know other forms of innovative agriculture true yeah. and for a state that's so rich in natural resources one would think that would you know definitely be a source of income for women through self help groups and Absolutely. fruit processing and Absolutely. forest produce. Absolutely. There are heaps of NGOs who are working there trying mm -hmm. to bring innovative crops like tussar silk and other things, you know, the, the silk worm. And, mm -hmm. But it will take a bit of time. Uh, but as I said, the building industry, absolutely the land mafia, mm -hmm. the building mafia, which are very dangerous to the ecology of the hills. True, true. You've also just mentioned that tourism has, you know, in a way, wrecked the state. Um, tourism is a significant sort of bringer in of income to the state, and at this present time, we're in a pandemic where tourism would have pretty much come to an end. Um, how do you see? Uh, how has the region been affected by the present pandemic, and how do you see things perhaps improving going forward? well you know the pandemic has been a boon as well as perhaps a curse a boon in the sense that it has brought the pahari thinking back to the basics you know how can i live my life simply in fact why say pahari it has brought us also back to the basics what can we do without i know whole villages in the kumau where they have refused to send their children their sons down to work in the plains because they say we have one son or we have two sons the life is more precious than the money brought back as you perhaps know that the kumau used to run on what was called a money order economy where people would go to the plains earn and send the money back in those days it was by money order but all that seems to have ended they've kept their children with them in the villages and tried to find ways and means within the village to create subsistence and that has been very good because it's a looking inwards instead of outwards mm -hmm. so i do not think the pandemic for the kumau hills has been really bad because i really think it has made them think what can the hills do for themselves i belong to a whatsapp group in rani khet and it's so interesting that my whatsapp group everyone has gone up to the hills quarantined themselves live their lives beautifully not interacted and try to contain the virus i think that has been very nice and they have not really wanted that we need or we are desperate for uh, you know interaction or restaurants and so on and so forth so though i should not say this but i think the pandemic has been restful in some ways of course there's the other aspect of it the tragedies of people who have been killed through this virus mm -hmm. but on the other hand it has made the kumaunis reflect on medical facilities and many ngos are now thinking of village doctors village uh, you know medical facilities setting up uh, uh, healthcare through vans health setting up healthcare through internet so these are different things that have grown in it and i'm trying to look at it in a positive light of course the negativity you all know about i don't think i need to go into that because that is something that all of india is suffered from um it's been a pleasure reading your book and interacting with you in this conversation so now that you uh, perhaps you know, retreated to the hills during the pandemic and i'm sure you would have had time to reflect and write and you did mention another book that you're working on 
So what are some of the topics that you would like to write about or books that you would like to create in the future? Well, um, I have three which are very much on my mind. And uh, some of them, of course, I've been jotting. One of them would be set in the hills itself and would actually look at the history of the hills from the colonial period onwards, but not a history book. Uh, the second would is something which is, again, similar to that in thinking, but really tries to understand uh, the Hindu-Muslim uh, dynamic in uh, the in what was called Avad or Eastern UP. And uh, the third book, which is actually has been half done for a long time, but just hasn't come together, is an understanding of my own community, which is the Kashmiri Brahmins who migrated from Kashmir and became part of the Indian polity, especially in the 1920s and 30s, through the middle classes, you know, what you would call the likhne padhne wale, you know, the reading, writing, um, you know, uh, backbone of governance and thereby led the help in the freedom movement and became the secular backbone of the new modern India. So these are the three themes that are in my head. God knows when they'll get done, if they'll get done. But yes, these are things I want to work on. Thank Wonderful. you for asking. Uh, no, it's so good to hear about uh, you know your creative thinking and what you plan to do in the future. So we wish you the very best to bring those books to fruition and completion. We look forward to seeing them in print. And thank you for sparing the time for this interaction. It's been a pleasure talking with you and for sharing the whole creative process of how your book came about. Well, thank you, Priya, because I think your questions were very well thought of and thought through. It means you really have read the book and I'm grateful for that. It was my pleasure to have read the book and I'm so happy that we've had this conversation. Thank you. I'd like to just say a word of appreciation to Bikash Nuri. Of course. Because even before the book got done on Kumar, he just said to me, I'm publishing it. Take your time. Wonderful. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that, ma'am. Thank you.